Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Isaiah chapter 10. We actually covered the first four verses last week, uh, tied in with most of the message from chapter 9. As we know from chapter 9, verse 8, through chapter 10, verse 4, Isaiah has given to us a poem, four stanzas, seven lines each that were given to us as God was describing the punishment and the judgment that was going to come upon Israel because of their disobedience and because of their sin. Now in chapter 10, as we pick up in verse 5 and we'll work through to verse 34 to the end of the chapter, we're going to see the Lord through Isaiah address Israel and make it very plain to them that the threat of judgment that God has made against His people for their spiritual adultery, for their idolatry, for their unfaithfulness. It is not an idle threat. Because there are other prophets other than Isaiah and Hosea who are ministering also at this time for themselves and who are preaching a message of peace. Of course, because God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God would never let the Assyrians come and destroy you. And that mean, nasty, hateful man, Isaiah, all of the things that he's saying that are going to happen. God would never allow that to happen to His people. Never mind the need for conviction for sin, the need to preach the truth so that people might repent. But the false prophets were preaching a gospel of peace as if God would wink at their sin. We're going to find out this morning that God assures the nation of Israel that the threat of judgment is not an idle threat. Assyria will be the Lord's instrument against Israel. God will use Assyria. And in fact, in the first verse of our lesson this morning, of the sermon this morning from verse 5, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. God says very plainly to the people, I'm going to use Assyria to bring judgment upon you because of your sinfulness, because you've not repented and returned to me, because you've closed your ears, you've shut your eyes, you don't want to hear, you've rejected me and my rule and my word and my prophets. So I'm going to use Assyria to exact the punishment for your sin. What we also see in the text this morning is that when Assyria does this, when they are used of God to judge Israel, at that point, Assyria will reach its zenith in history. And when they strike the people of God, immediately they begin to decline. And Isaiah is going to address that. He'll address the decline, especially in passages to come, of the decline of Assyria and of Egypt with Babylon and the Medes and the Persians arriving upon the scene, as you know in Daniel's vision, the nations that would rise and one would replace another until finally that great stone which represents the kingdom of God would smash all of the kingdoms of the world to dust. But Assyria, even used in the sovereign hands of God, itself because they stretch their hands out against the people of God, are going to decline and eventually are themselves going to be defeated under divine punishment. The first few verses from verses 5 through 11 show us the Lord's wrath. And again, I know we're in Isaiah and we're ten chapters in, so it's not strange to us to talk about judgment and wrath. But I want you to understand that there are people who report to me almost on a weekly basis from churches that they are in. They email and they've listened to sermons online and they say, people aren't preaching about wrath anymore. People aren't preaching about anger. Now, that's probably because they're not preaching in the Old Testament very much. But then there's this idea, and they say, well, the God of the Old Testament is mean, and He's angry, and He's upset, and He kills everybody. But in the New Testament, He presents Himself as the God of love. Heretics. That's Marcionism. God is God. He is the same. And if you don't believe that there is wrath in the New Testament, one of the first things that Jesus said to the Pharisees was, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And when he began preaching, when Jesus began his public ministry, he began with this word, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the kingdom of heaven coming was not for the lost a good thing, because when the kingdom comes, the judgment begins. You see, God is not wrathful in the old and not wrathful in the new. God is wrathful because God is holy and we are sinful. And as he expresses his anger toward sin, 
I don't think that we need to offer excuses for a God who would warn us and tell us that He is angry and that in that anger, again, it's not an uncontrolled rage, it is a perfect hatred for wickedness because He is the perfect embodiment of holiness. And so He pronounces a curse upon Assyria here. And He says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of My anger and the staff in whose hand is My indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of My wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet He does not mean so. Nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Cano like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? We find here that God is angry at sin. And that this anger is what empowers Assyria to bring judgment to bear upon Israel. And we're going to find out later in the text, about halfway through the chapter, that Isaiah turns his attention back to Judah at the south. But for now, he's still talking to Israel and addressing Assyria that is going to be used to judge. And he says that Assyria is the rod of my anger and is the staff in whose hand is my indignation. But as he sends Assyria against Israel, understand the language that he uses here. First, he says, woe to Assyria. In other words... I am going to take you apart piece by piece. I'm going to judge you too. You are the tool of judgment that I am using against Israel, but the result will be that you will be judged as well. Why? For rejecting Him as God and as King. And he says here some shocking things about Israel. He says, I will send Him, meaning Assyria, against an ungodly nation. That's Israel. He says, Assyria, woe to them, but they are the rod of my anger. They are the staff in whose hand is my indignation. And I'm going to send Assyria against an ungodly nation. Against, literally the term is, a godless nation. Now wait a minute. Israel's, Israel can't be godless. Well, well, I mean, can they? Well, they've kind of got a lot of gods at this point, don't they? Because they've rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they've set up idols even within the very temple to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some think that they can worship God and idols. Some are just worshiping idols and rejecting God. They don't want to hear God's word from the prophets. They want to hear from the false prophets. They've rejected God. They've cast Him off. And the good news is that God is going to tell us that He's true to His covenant. But as far as His people are concerned, they are living as if there was no God. They are an ungodly nation. A godless nation. You see, every time we decide for ourselves to disobey God, what we have really done is we have said that we confess with our mouth and with our lips that God is sovereign. But every time we disobey Him, we are saying, but I believe and I'm going to live like I'm sovereign. Like it's my choice. You see what it really boils down to, to look at Israel as a godless nation, at this accusation that they are an ungodly, a godless nation without any spiritual restraint at all. They've chased after the idols. What we're really seeing is that they have set themselves over and above God and they've said to God, we know better than you what to do. Is that not the whole controversy with Isaiah coming to Ahaz and telling him, don't go to Assyria for help. They're the enemy. They're not going to help. Instead, go to the Lord for your help. But no, Ahaz decided to go to Assyria to ask for human help and not to go to God. Hezekiah is the opposite example later in history when Assyria did come and turn around and they came and attacked Israel and then came to attack Judah. Hezekiah prayed and he turned to the Lord and he took the letter that Sennacherib had written to him threatening him and he laid it out in front of the temple before the Lord and he said, God, what do you want to do about this? Ahaz was not so. And so under these ungodly kings, this sinful nation is actually, the people of God here are addressed as a godless nation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. He, it, it's a play on words here. What does God usually say? These are my people. Now he says these are the people of my wrath. It's been reserved for them to sit under judgment to be destroyed in these horrible judgments we read around in chapter 5 and in chapter 10. 
to see the horrible things that Assyria was going to do to decimate the land and to take the people into captivity from which the ten tribes never returned. And as they come, they're coming against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. God says, I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. A couple of actions here that God takes. First, He sends Assyria against a godless nation. Secondly, He commands. Uh, the phrase is, He dispatches. When He says, I will give him charge, He dispatches Assyria against those who have angered Him. So, who's doing the judging here? You see, Assyria is not doing the judging Assyria is merely the tool in the hands of God. It's God who's actively judging His people. And you may have heard it this way, that people talk about the God of the New Testament being a loving God and that God would never send anyone to hell. Now, the, the theological way to try to deal with that is that you actually send yourselves to hell because that's what you choose. You read the book of Revelation and you read what happens when the lost are cast into the lake of fire. This is at the great white throne judgment. Now think about this for a minute because this is Jesus judging. This is Jesus casting the lost into eternal punishment. God is doing the judging here. Assyria is just the tool. And in fact, Assyria is not even sure. They don't have the right intentions for what they're doing. They're doing it for one reason, but God's using them for another. But He commands Assyria against those who anger Him. Guess what? God can use ungodly nations, can't He? Oh yes, He can, and oh yes, He will. Do you understand that Satan is nothing more than a puppet? And by puppet, I mean that Satan has no authority. He's been given authority on the earth, but who gave him that authority? The sovereign of all creation. You understand that Satan even has to appear before God to ask permission? Look at the book of Job. He has to ask permission before he can do anything. You see, this is not some great cosmic battle between God and between Satan over the souls of men. This is God unfolding His purposes in creation and even using the devil to accomplish His purposes. What God is this that you're preaching to us about? God uses the devil? Well, whatever happens... Whatever unfolds, whatever transpires in our life, what does God promise us as His children? I'll work it all out for good. How does He do that if He's not in absolute control? And we're going to get to a couple of phrases here in a minute where Isaiah uses the phrase, the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And from the Hebrew, that actually would be better translated, the Lord, the only sovereign one. You see, there are not many sovereigns. There is one, and He is the Lord. God is sovereign. And every time we choose to go our own way and to do our own thing, every time we choose sin over faithfulness and obedience, every time we choose to follow the flesh and our old nature, we are trying to set ourselves up as the sovereign. But we cannot be because only God is. So it is He who is commanding the Assyrians. It says that He sets a boundary for them for the damages when they can go to the spoil, to seize the spoil and to take the prey. This actually is a command wherein God sets the limits. And it's not going to be total destruction because again, even in the harshest of judgments, there always seems to be found a drop of mercy. By the way, this is also a play, again, on the second son of Isaiah, when he says, I will give him charge to seize the spoil and to take the prey. Remember Maher Shalahashbaz? His name means hastening to the spoil, quickening after the prey. It is the hurrying to judgment. So this is even, Isaiah is even using here a play on the name of his son. He'll use his other son's name later in the text. So he says, God's warned you. God's told you what's going to happen. He's going to use the Assyrians. He's going to send them against a godless nation. He's going to command them. He's going to set the boundary for the damage that they can do. Maher Shalahashbaz, my son, my son whose name you all know is a living parable of the judgment of God that's coming upon you. And he's going to punish. He's going to tread them down like mire in the streets. Verse 7 says, yet he does not mean so. Now the he here is Assyria. That means Assyria, Assyria doesn't mean to be used as a tool of wrath. They're not trying to bring the people to a place where they're being punished for their sins. They're just trying to conquer the world. 
you know, that's their intention. That's their motive. What are we going to do tonight? We're going to take over the world. This is Assyria. This is the madman. This is the dictator who is in charge of the greatest military power on earth at this time. And his whole concern is to find more people to kill, to dominate, to conquer, and to rule. He does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. He says, I want to cut off nations. I want to conquer people. The king's heart is set on destruction and on conquest. He says, for he says, are not my princes altogether kings? This is actually an interesting phrase because what he's really saying is that what you've got are a bunch of kings and a bunch of nations that Assyria wants to conquer. And they know that part of conquering then is to either humiliate, to capture, to enslave, or kill the kings. But the leaders here are shrewd in Assyria because they know if you kill the kings, that usually just emboldens the people to fight against you harder. And that's just going to mean that the, the military campaign is going to take longer for conquest. So the, the, the key here is to conquer these kings, to capture these kings. And in fact, they did this. They did this to Ahaz. They took Ahaz to Assyria. But then they sent him back. Well, Why did they send him back? Well, because they turned him to the point that they said, Look, here's our gods. Our gods are greater than your gods. And you, you, you can't even appeal to your God because He's not going to stop us. We're the greatest power. Nobody stopped us. Nobody stopped us yet. You're not going to stop us. And Ahaz's response was to bring people up to make copies of the altars to the gods of the Assyrians and go back and build altars in the temple that matched. So he came back an absolute traitor. This is what this verse refers to. He says, these kings that are being conquered, they become Assyria's princes. And the word prince is those who carry out the king's edicts. In other words, I'm capturing these kings and I'm sending them back to do my bidding. I'm winning them without having to kill them all. Now what's the benefit there? Well, if you win them without having to kill them all, you have a workforce. You have a labor force. You have an economic situation that is to your benefit because you haven't had to kill all of the men who could be working to support the taxes and the tariffs going back to the kingdom, to Assyria. So he says, I want to conquer. I want conquest. I want the kings of the nations around me to become Assyria's princes. I want to show that our gods are superior to their gods. In fact, uh, the Rabshakeh, who is the military commander of the Assyrian army, in 2 Kings 18, asked this question of Israel. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has there been one nation whose god has been able to spare them from conquest? Where are the gods of Hamath or Arpad? We just read them. They're in our text this morning. Two cities. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sephravaim and Henna and Iva? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? He's talking here. And he tells Hezekiah, you're not going to be able to stand. Your God's not going to be able to stop us. No other God has stopped us. And this is what Isaiah says. He says, you look, Assyria is on the rampage. And they're saying, is not Kalno like Carchemish, Hamath like Arpad, Samaria like Damascus? In these cities here, we have a list of cities that fell one by one from the north to the south. And as they're paired up, basically what the king is saying is, I took all of them, I can take you too. Now where they overstepped was when they told Hezekiah, the Lord cannot stop us. And Hezekiah took that before the Lord. And that night, 185,000 Assyrians died in the field. And Sennacherib returned home. Whereupon entering the temple of his God, his own son assassinated him. So then you ask Assyria, what about these gods that couldn't stop you? Well, it's because they weren't God. They made these threats. They threatened Israel. They threatened Judah. Israel turned to Assyria for help instead of turning to the Lord. And they fell. Judah turned to the Lord for help. And He rescued them. In looking at these cities, Calno was destroyed in 738, Carchemish in 717, Hamath in 720, Arpad in 740, Samaria in 722 when Israel was taken into captivity, Damascus 10 years before that in 732, right around this time where this prophecy is being made and where this pronouncement is being uttered. If we go forward in time just a little bit, I always like to take a rabbit trail at Carchemish. 
Carchemish conquered by Assyria, but became a scene of a greater battle later. And in fact, this revolves around the life of Josiah, the godly king, who became king at the age of eight. As we look at Josiah and as we look at his life and as we look at his reforms, as we look at revival, as we look at the fact that when Josiah came upon the scene, in his faithfulness and in his obedience, he actually won for the people a reprieve from judgment and there was a time of revival before finally the Babylonians did come and they conquered Judah and took them into captivity just like the prophets told them would happen. But what happened here after Assyria had attacked Israel and taken them into captivity, then they began to decline, and they began to weaken. And the Egyptians decided that they thought that they should attack. And then they actually went with Assyria to try to fight Babylon, because Babylon was the rising power. And Egypt kind of took advantage of the situation. They saw that Assyria, who was the big guy on the block, suddenly wasn't so great, but Babylon was up and coming. So maybe now Egypt could join with Assyria, and two little guys could take the big guy. So they marched off for battle. And they met Josiah. We read about the account in Second Chronicles. Listen, this also shows, by the way, God, uh, one, one commentator, the quote was that God, the Lord, rides upon world history for the accomplishments of His holy purposes. God rides upon world history for the accomplishment of His purposes. Just as God can use Assyria as a tool in His hand, so He can use other countries what happened in this battle was that after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. So Egypt and Assyria were going to Carchemish to fight the Babylonians and to try to stop their expansion. But in order to get there, Josiah and Judah were in the way. So Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house which I have, with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Necho, the pharaoh of Egypt, says to Josiah, I'm not here to fight you. Get out of the way. I'm going to fight the Babylonians. Because God commanded me to do this. God commanded you to do this. Wait a minute. Who are you listening to? Are we sure? Refrain from meddling with God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself so that he might fight with him. Josiah put on a disguise so they wouldn't know he was the king. He was in battle. He rode into battle in a chariot. He did not listen to the words of Necho. And listen to this verse. He did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archer shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. Josiah died in battle because God told the king of Egypt to go join with Assyria and fight against Babylon. Now, of course, the king in Egypt thought that meant that he was on God's mission and was going to be victorious. Josiah stood in the way, and Josiah did not listen to the words of God that came out of the mouth of Necho, and as a result, Josiah died in battle. Egypt killed him and went on. They defeated Judah, marched on to Carchemish, and in 609 BC, Assyria and Egypt were defeated by the Babylonians. Now, had God told Necho to go. We have the testimony of Scripture. God told Pharaoh Necho to go and to fight. Necho thought then, because God was telling him to go, that that meant he was going to be victorious and get everything that he wanted. But what happened in the end? He was destroyed. And the Babylonians rose to power. You see, the Assyrians, they don't think they're doing God's mission. They just want to rule the world. And nobody stopped them, and nobody's gods have been able to stop them. And even those who did hear from the Lord, just because God tells you to go somewhere and sends you on a mission, understand something. That does not mean that you're going to come out with the results that you expect. Who knows why God may send you where He sends you. But it's always for His glory, isn't it? And it will always be worked out for our good. Well, here as we look at these cities 
as we look at the destruction that is coming. In verse 10, Assyria, speaking as a man, says, As my hand has found the kingdom of the idols, whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her images, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? He plays on words here, and he uses the word idols, images, images, and idols. And the word that he uses for idols actually is a word that could be translated as no god or a worthless god. So he says, As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria. In other words, I've come up against nations that have had better kings than yours. Assyria wasn't really impressed with God. We've had we've we fought people who worshiped gods that were more powerful than your God, more impressive idols, more impressive images, and as I have done to Samaria and her idols, so I'm going to do to Jerusalem and her idols. And when he talks about coming up to the kingdoms of the idols, literally he says here, we fought against kingdoms who really don't have a God that can be named. They are the kingdoms of no God, because there was no God to defend them, and we conquered them. Now this is amazing because when you look at it from God's perspective, God is using Assyria as a tool in His hand to bring judgment upon Israel. But as far as Israel's concerned, and as far as Assyria is concerned, Assyria thinks there's no God in Israel. Because all of these other places had idols and images that were even more impressive, and they didn't stop us. We're not afraid of your God. He's not going to be able to do anything. Now the problem is, is Israel didn't know who they were following. They were following all of the idols too. They were following all of these worthless idols. They were worshipping gods that are not gods. Things that don't exist. Things that have been carved. Images made by men. And so Assyria saw no threat. They had already conquered Samaria and Damascus. They were now prepared to go and to take Jerusalem. And this is where Judah is concerned because they're coming after Israel first, but they've just let Judah know we're coming after you next. We're coming to Jerusalem next. Therefore, we're told, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all His work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. God says that Assyria might be doing what they think they want to do, but ultimately what's going to win the victory for the day is going to be the work of the Lord. The work of Assyria is not going to stand, but the work of the Lord is going to stand forever. And God says this, here in verse 12, He says, when I'm finished with the work I'm doing in Israel, so is Assyria. This is the beginning of the end. Assyria now is going to be judged. For what? For striking the people of God. You see, God is bringing judgment, but when He uses another ungodly nation to judge His ungodly people, in the end, there's not a nation that's going to be left standing. They're all going to sit under the judgment of God. They've all neglected the Sovereign One. They've all rejected Him as being the God who should be heard and obeyed. So when the Lord is finished, so is Assyria. When He has performed all His work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For He says, By the strength of My hand I have done it. This is the king of Assyria. By the strength of My hand I have done it, and by My wisdom, for I am prudent. See, I am strong and I am wise. I have strength and wisdom. And He says, Also I have removed the boundaries of the people. And have robbed their treasuries, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. I have conquered. And this is what the king of Assyria says. This is his profession. When he says, I have conquered them and robbed them and removed their boundaries and put them down like a valiant man. The phrase for valiant man literally means to be godlike in power and might. The king of Assyria is saying, there's no other god in any other nation that's able to stand against me because compared to them and to their gods, I am a god. There is no one who has wisdom and strength and power like me. I am... Godlike in my ability to wage war and to conquer and to rule the world. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the peoples, and as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the nations, and there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. He said, It's like I found eggs in a nest, in a tree, and I just reached out and took it. It was easy 
Because before me and my God-likeness, nothing can stand in my way. Uh, the only more haughty king, I think, that we find in all of the scriptures is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And God showed him too, didn't he? He humbled him and drove him insane out into the fields to live like an animal for seven years. And when he woke up and he came to his senses, what was his profession? Was that God alone was God. I'll tell you, Nebuchadnezzar makes some more solid confessions than many preachers these days. He knew the truth. He had seen the sovereign Lord in his actions. But the Lord here tells the king of Assyria that for all of his achievements and power, for all of his strength and wisdom, for his being a valiant man, when he, when he, when he oversteps, this is where he oversteps, when he really does it, he says, I have gathered all the earth. In other words, the king of Assyria says, all of the earth is mine for the taking. <coughs> Wrong. Sorry. No. To the law, to the testimony. What does God say? Psalm 24 verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. He did try to play the part of God. He did try to do what God even was forbidding him to do. And he was stopped. He was not allowed to go any further. And the nation eventually was destroyed. You see, God forbids and men disobey because men think that they are greater than God. And in the end, what we will see is that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That God alone is sovereign. The result here in verse 15 is that the king of Assyria and the power of Assyria is going to be left like a hollow man. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Think about the axe leaning up against the wall. Can it go chop a tree by itself? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up? Or as if a staff could lift up as if it, as if it were not wood? What God is saying is that for all that the king of Assyria has been able to accomplish, it is only what God has allowed him to accomplish that has come to pass. And when God draws the line and shuts the door, that's it. You understand, people say that when God shuts the door, He opens a window. Not necessarily. And when God shuts a door, it stays shut. Uh, usually He shuts the door so you can nail 95 theses on it. So that you can make a point. So that you can learn a theological lesson. But when God shuts the door, He shuts the door. He is going to leave Assyria hollowed out. In John eleven nineteen, 19, Jesus was before Pilate. And Pilate was talking about the authority and the power that he had. He could free Jesus, he told him. If you just answer my question, just satisfy me. I can let you go. And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Ultimately, it is God who is in control. God does not yield that control. God does not turn that control over. And even when we see awful things happening throughout the history of mankind, this is what we understand. God Himself rides upon world history to accomplish His holy purposes, to preserve His people, to bring them to Himself. God is working out His plan in history. You've, you've heard the little, the little pun. It's called history because it is His story. It's true. It's His story. He's written it. Written. Past tense. It's already finished. He knows the outcome. Nothing new or surprising is happening as far as God is concerned. And we look at the things that happen in this world and we look at the chaos and we look at the hurt and we look at the grief and we wonder, what is God doing? Well, nobody ever cares to ask God about anything until they're hurting and grieving, do they? He's drawing us to Himself. He's teaching us to depend upon Him. He's showing us that He can use these things for good. I actually commented... To Esther this morning, Esther, when she texted her prayer request about her mom being still in the hospital. And her comment was, I just, I don't see there being a sigh of relief in this anytime soon. And my comment was that sometimes I'm becoming convinced that God's purpose in this life for us, for us to reach the end of it, absolutely worn out and tired of self and sin. 
waiting to rest in Jesus, waiting to see Him face to face. There is the sigh of relief when we deal with sickness and with death, to wake up face to face with Christ. We will not be repaid in this life. We have no promise of that. The only people promising you that you're going to get repaid for your faith in this life have something to sell. What we are promised is that in the world you will have tribulation. But, what is Jesus' response? Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. It's already finished. As we celebrate Veterans Day today, and as we celebrate significantly the fact that a hundred years ago today, the armistice was signed to end the Great War. The comment was that World War I was to be the war to end all wars. No, the war to end all wars was not fought across the continents. That war was fought and it was won at the cross when Jesus said, It's finished. That's the war that will end all wars. We look at what mankind can do to one another. We look at destruction. We look at mayhem. We look at those who are valiant heroes in our past and in the history of our nation. And yet nothing compares. Nothing in all of history compares to what God is doing and what He will do to glorify Himself in the midst of this fallen world. He is bringing judgment. In verse 16, he says, Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And this is the phrase. It's here in verse 16, and it's also in verse 33. The Hebrew term. This is the Lord, not Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D, not His proper name. This is a title. And the title in Hebrew is this, The Lord, the Sovereign One. This is the stress now for this chapter. God coming in judgment, using Assyria as a tool in His hand, threatening Israel with judgment. It is because He is the Lord. He is the Sovereign One. And He's going to judge Assyria. He says, Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among His fat ones. Here fatness describes health and strength. Assyria now is fat and strong. And they're going to be lean and weak. I'm going to send wasting upon them. And they're going to waste away. And under His glory, He will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. There's going to be a consuming fire and a leanness, a plague upon Assyria. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and His Holy One for a flame. And it, it will burn and devour His thorns and His briars in one day. And it will consume the glory of His forest and of His fruited, fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. He tells them here, He's going to judge. And in verse 19, He tells them how severe the judgment will be. He says, Then the rest of the trees of His forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. This is what God says, When I am done burning down the forest that is Assyria, there will only be a few sparse trees left in that burnt down forest. So few trees, in fact, that if you were to send someone to take a census, a little child who can't even count very high would be more than adequate for the task. This is, this, understand, at this time when this is being uttered, Assyria is at its zenith. It is the greatest power on the earth. Notice two great world powers. God has all of the power. He is the sovereign one. And nations will rise and nations will fall according to His will and His will alone. And here the greatest, most powerful nation on the face of the earth at this point in time is told, you are going to be struck, you are going to waste away, you're going to be consumed with fire. The description here is that there's going to be your glory, all of your might, all of your magnificent, it's going to be consumed in fire because the light... The Holy One who is a flame is going to consume your nation. He's going to consume the forest where there's wild growth, the fruitful field where there's cultivated pastures. He's going to bring this wasting sickness that's going to affect body and soul. God is going to reduce you to something so small that a child can take count of it. Does this lessen God in any way? God cannot be lessened. It is in God that all things consist. And as He promises these things, He promises that His light is going to shine. And He says, so the light of Israel will be for a fire, 
Psalm 27 verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When God brings this judgment upon Assyria, He is going to leave only a bare remnant. But now we see God's word to Judah. It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. There is going to be a remnant preserved. And whereas Assyria is going to be judged and only survive as a remnant that can be counted by a child, when God judges His people, He's leaving a remnant of those who find their hope in Him. You see, the purpose of discipline is what? Restoration. Correction. Bringing the people to repentance. And it shall come to pass when God judges Assyria that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them but will depend upon the Lord. This is what God... By this point in time, by the time this happens in history, God has been telling them for hundreds of years, turn to me, depend on me, return to me, depend on me, return to me, depend on me. And they don't. But finally in this moment, they will. The remnant will return the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Out of the judgment will come righteous purposes. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. God is going to work this out. And did you hear the name of Isaiah's other son? Remember what his name was? Shir Jashub. What did it mean? A remnant will return. One son is named a remnant will return. The other son is named that you're hurrying to destruction and to spoil. There is judgment and salvation, both presented in the sons of Isaiah to the people of God. The judgment of Israel was going to leave not just a remnant that could merely be counted, but a penitent remnant. Hosea 3.5 says, Afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. They're going to return. The judgment of Israel will serve a purpose. There will be a determined end. Another commentator said that the sin of God's people never goes unpunished. But neither does the opposing world ever manage to proceed through to final victory. The world may be used as a tool in God's hands to judge His people, but then God is going to judge those nations because it is the Lord who should be feared. As we look at the final ten verses, verses 24 through 34, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people, did you just hear the change? Earlier they were you people. They were the people of my wrath. Suddenly grace bursts through. In this light that consumes one in judgment, there is salvation for the other. Therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. Who is he talking to now? He's talking to Judah. Don't be afraid, because Assyria is going to do this to Israel, and then they're going to come after you next. And this was the encounter with Hezekiah. They're going to come after you, but they're going to be stopped. God's going to take care of them. He will strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so will he lift up in, a manner, in the manner of Egypt. God says, don't fear. Fear not, O oh my people. He's not addressing all the people of the world, but his people. His people will be preserved. His people will be kept. And he says, in a little while, Assyria is going to be destroyed. I want to define something biblically for you. We're going to get back to math here. I want to define something for you. Because you see, this didn't happen 
for 120 years. God said, in a little while. The phrase is, very soon I'm going to deal with Assyria and judge them and they're going to be done and it's going to be over. So, very soon for God is 120 years. Now, I can explain the math to you. Um, Peter tells us, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Well, if a thousand years for us is like a day to the Lord, that means that 120 years is actually less than three hours. Uh, think, think about it this way. Uh, if you live to 40, woo, if you live to 40, you've lived one hour. If you live to 80, two. Two hours. In God's time frame, God who inhabits eternity, our life, it's a vapor. Now you look at how complicated those two hours tend to be. And you look at the length of a life. And it's here today and it is gone tomorrow. And this is why the Lord tells us, now, Today is the day of salvation. Awake you who sleep. Today is the day of salvation. Sennacherib survived attacking Judah. But just like that, he returned home and he was killed. The judgment is described as when the Midianite leaders were caught. When Gideon raised his army and God reduced it. And they went and fought Midian. And several of the princes escaped. Uh, these are some of my favorite names in the Old Testament. Uh... Oreb and Zeb, they escaped and they were caught and they were killed. Judges 7.25, they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb. I don't think it was called that before they killed him there. And Zeb, they killed at the wine press of Zeb. Same thing. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. God says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to overcome Assyria just like Gideon and his army overcame the Midianites. I'm going to bring that kind of destruction. And in that day, he keeps referring to in that day. He says, therefore, yet a very little while and the indignation will cease and my anger in their destruction. The Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so he will lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. This is an interesting word that Isaiah gives here. He says the burden, the yoke of Assyria, the yoke of their oppression is going to be broken because of the anointing oil. What is he talking about? Well, who got anointed with oil? Kings. Specifically here, David. Think about David talking about the death of Saul. He said, O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. Now, had Saul been anointed? He had, but then what had happened? He sinned, and David was anointed while Saul was still reigning. And what David attributes the death of Saul to is, you remember at first David wouldn't kill, he wouldn't reach out, he wouldn't touch Saul. He said, he's the Lord's anointed, I'm not going to touch him. Well, when he died, what does David confess? He died because the anointing had been removed. There was no anointing. Psalm 89, verses 20 and 21, I have found my servant David... With my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. David was anointed. The reason that the Assyrians are going to be stopped is because of the Davidic promises, the promises of the Messiah. You see what God is working out through all of this, through the judgment of Israel, through the attack on Judah, through the destruction of Assyria and Egypt, through the rise and fall of Babylon and the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks after them, and then the Romans. Uh, what God is doing through all of that is bringing us all to a point in time to where He's going to fulfill the promises He gave in chapter 7 and in chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He's doing all of this to preserve a line for the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah then finally closes this word out 
with a vision. He envisions the approach of Assyria. And he names these places. And each place that he names is closer to the wall at Jerusalem. He has come to Aiath. That, by the way, is the city of Ai. Fifteen miles from Jerusalem. He has passed Migron. At Michmash, he has attended to his equipment. Michmash was a narrow pass. It was a place where you descended 300 feet, went through a narrow canyon, and up another 500 feet to ascend toward Jerusalem, about seven miles from Jerusalem. But what you had to do to get through the pass at Michmash was you had to take your equipment off because you couldn't get through with a full pack. So he says, the army's coming, and I see them at Ai in 15 miles, and I see them at Migron, and I see them at Michmash, and they're doing everything you need to do with your equipment to get through. And they've gone along the ridge, and they've taken up lodging at Geba, Rama is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish, O poor Anatoth. Mad- Madmana has fled. The inhabitants of Gabim seek refuge. And yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist. Nob is a little over a mile outside of Jerusalem. You can stand there on a clear day, shake your fist at Jerusalem, and someone on the wall would have been able to see you. Assyria is coming. They're marching down the path. They're passing all of the places. Nobody's stopping them. Nothing's hindering them, not even the landscape. And they're going to shake their fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. What happens next? Well, you remember how he began this part of the passage? O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. Because there they are at Ai. And there they're coming through the pass. And now they're one town closer. And one village closer. And now they're a mile away. And now you can see them coming. And here they are at the gate. Verse 33. Look! Behold! The Lord, the Sovereign One, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. In Ezekiel 31, Assyria is referenced. Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with fine branches that shaded the forest, a high stature, and its top was among thick boughs. Here this great mighty army comes marching down upon Jerusalem and as it's envisioned by Isaiah and he sees them coming and they're ready to attack. The city's told not to fear because their Lord, He is the Sovereign One. And with one move, He leveled that army. In one night, 185,000 of them dead. And the leader sent home in disgrace to be assassinated by his own family in the temple of his false god. For all of the boasting against the Lord, God used Assyria to judge Israel. And when they turned toward Judah, God said, Enough. You're not doing anything else now. You're going to decline. You're going to waste away. You're going to find leanness. You're going to be burned up and consumed. You're going to be destroyed. And the cry to His people is, Look, the Lord, the Sovereign One. He would defend Jerusalem. This is what He told Ahaz. If you would turn to Me, I will defend you. But Ahaz refused. The kings that came after him refused. They refused the Lord. They refused His Word. They refused His prophets. They refused His promises because they thought they knew better. The lesson for us in this week to come, as soon as you think you know best, please understand there is only one sovereign and He is the Lord. Look to Him. Look to Him in your grief for comfort. Look to Him in your pain for relief. Look to Him in your confusion for truth and for understanding. Look to Him in your disappointment. Look to Him in your suffering. Look to Him even in the times of blessing. You know what? It's so easy not to look at Him when He's blessed us. We we can look at Him when we're hurting, but when He blesses us, that's when it's hard to look because things are going along smoothly and okay. Well then, then especially then, we need to look. Why do we need to look? Because He is the Lord, the Sovereign One. This is who Isaiah presents to the people. He presents judgment. 
And he shows how God overrules in the nations of men to accomplish His holy purposes. He shows how God is working all of these things out for good because He is the Sovereign. In this week to come, don't just confess with your mouth that He's sovereign. Live your life like He is. What that means is, O oh my people, do not be afraid. Psalm 56.3 What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. Why can we trust in Him when we should be fearful and fleeing? When everything is confusing and we're not certain, we can trust in Him because whatever else happens in this world, He is in charge of it all. He's sovereign. Again, take this encouragement. Look to the Lord. Don't merely confess Him as sovereign, but trust Him because He is. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. We thank You for especially these two verses. Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Behold the Lord, the Sovereign One. You who rule and reign. You who have created all that is out of nothing. And who rule it for Your purposes. And who work every circumstance for our good and for Your glory. Father, I pray that You would teach us to look to You in those circumstances, to glorify You in them, whether they are painful or confusing, or whether they are times of blessing and times of peace. Help us in those times especially to bless Your name, because we have what we have because we've been given it from Your hand. And every gift that You give us, You tell us, is perfect and good. We thank You that You are the Sovereign One and that we are not. We thank You that we are not in charge and that it does not depend upon us. We thank You that You are God. This morning I pray that You would remind us what a great Savior we have, what a glorious God we serve. And we thank You this morning that we can call You our God and You call us and refer to us as Your people. In this week to come, I pray that You would find us faithful, find us obedient, find us committed to live in accordance with Your Word and to preach it to those who need to hear it to go and to bear testimony of the Lord, the Sovereign One. We thank You this morning for who You are as our God. In Jesus' name, Amen.